chapter 28 for our key scripture. In a few weeks, we're going to be starting a new sermon series. You put that up there, Aaron? While you're turning the bathroom. Spiritual Wars in the Armor of God, June 2016. And uh, I'm going into territory I've never gone before. Uh, so we'll see how, how it plays out. You know, what I envision in my mind doesn't always translate well to the pulpit. So we'll see what happens. But we're going to be looking at the armor of God and, and how, we, uh, how we can use that in our everyday lives. So Matthew chapter 28, 16 through 20 today. As we begin this morning. <coughs> Post-resurrection appearances of Jesus. We're within that 40 days between uh, uh, the resurrection and Pentecost. And so here we have Jesus, the post-resurrection Jesus, giving his disciples the Great Commission. We're all familiar with this, I think. In verse 16, when the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The Great Commission. Now you know, when I was, uh, when Curtis was younger, he's not here today, so I can talk about him. Uh, when he was younger, uh, one of the shows he used to watch, and probably Courtney, and I'll admit, even I watched it, it was SpongeBob. SpongeBob SquarePants. Uh, the little yellow sponge that lives in a pineapple under, under the sea. And one of the episodes that I remember of SpongeBob, uh, he was going to boating school. For some reason, he could just never pass boating school to get his boating license. And so he went to school, and, and his teacher was Mrs. Puff, Puff Fish, and she got angry, she would puff up. And, uh, one of the things that this class did was they would, on a rotating basis, they would have um, somebody be the hall monitor. And SpongeBob had been looking forward to this week all year. And so it came time for his turn, and the teacher was very reluctant of giving him the uh, special sash and the authority because in the past he had taken it to extremes. But he got it, he got, the, he got a special sash, and he got a special whistle, and a special badge, and, and he went up and down the halls, and he would write people up, uh, the students up, for walking too fast, for throwing little pieces of paper in the trash that shouldn't have been put somewhere out. I mean, he would just go overboard. But he took his job seriously. Seriously. This was a special responsibility for him. And one of the reasons why I like this episode is because when I was in fifth grade, sixth grade, this was my pre-Indiana Jones years. This was back when I wanted to be a police officer and not an archaeologist. <laughs> um, we did the same thing. The fifth and sixth graders, the school that I went to only went up to sixth grade, so we were the upperclassmen. And we would rotate who would be the crossing guard. And I looked forward to that all the time because... It was the closest thing that I could be, uh, closest thing for me to be a cop without actually being a cop was being a crossing guard. And the teacher would call you up and she'd give you that special um, neon orange sash. She would give you the whistle and then she'd give you the special stop sign that you would hold in your hand. I mean, that was the thing you wanted. And I would stand on that corner and those little second graders would come up and I would make them stand there. And I'd walk out, it's a one-way road, I'd walk out there and hold that sign up, and I would tell the kids going, if they stepped off that curb too early, I'd blow that whistle, and I'd tell them to get by. I mean, I took it serious. I looked forward to that job every time I came up for it. Probably too serious. But when I hear Jesus' words in Matthew, I cannot help but to think about the way we should be approaching our role as disciples of Christ. Being witnessing disciples is a role we should take very seriously. 
But too many Christians, they wave it off as, well, I'll do it later, or that's somebody else's job. Let them take care of it. Too many Christians think, well, it's not important enough to worry about right now. But in the 21st century, I don't think there's any time that I can think of where it hasn't been more important than right now. I think it's important to make Jesus known. Now note, I didn't say that it was important to make the name of Jesus known. I think it's important to make Jesus known. Because we are living in a technological age where you can go online and you see things on Facebook and Instagram and you can, I mean, we're overloaded. Jesus' name is known. His name is known. The question is, is Jesus known? Do they know who Jesus is? I don't think we've been doing a good enough job of making Jesus known to the world because there's a difference. In a recent poll, when people were asked about Jesus, they said, yeah, I know Jesus. I've heard of Jesus. He was a persuasive man. Jesus was a smart man. Jesus was a nice guy. Jesus was another guy who founded another religion. Jesus was a messenger of God. Yeah, we know Jesus. I've heard of him. Jesus' name is known. But is Jesus known? People know the, the name, but do they know who he is? And I think it's more challenging today than ever to make him known because there's so much stuff in our world today. So much stuff. Senseless stuff. Senseless fluff filling our minds that Jesus gets lost in the crowd. We have to show that Jesus is relevant for our lives today. That he is alive. That he is with us. That he is working with us. That he is working through us. And that means that we sometimes have to go that extra mile. Sometimes that means we've got to take that extra step that we wouldn't normally take. It means listening for Jesus in the Spirit. And moving with Jesus in the Spirit. It means that we can't just stop with, yes, I believe in Jesus. We have to be ready to share why we believe in Jesus. Ask yourselves, what has Jesus done for me lately? And then share that answer with someone. If you take Philip and the eunuch, for example, in chapter 8 of the book of Acts, in chapter 8 of the book of Acts, an angel tells Philip to go south, to go to a desert road, and he's going to come up to a chariot, and he's going to meet an Ethiopian, a eunuch. This eunuch had gone to Jerusalem for worship, and this eunuch was on his way home, sitting in the chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. And the Spirit tells Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. So Philip runs up to the chariot, and he hears the man reading Isaiah. And he asks, do you understand what you're reading? And the eunuch says, how can I, unless someone explains it to me? So he invited Philip to come up and to sit with him. So I want to stop right there. I want to stop. Because I want to know how you would respond in that moment. How would you respond? Here's the quiz. How would you respond? A, here's Pastor Kurt's cell phone number. Call Pastor Kurt. He'll help you. God bless. B, have you checked out the Bible bookstore? There's lots of good resources there. You'll find something on Isaiah. C, Google it. <laughs> Google it. D, just pray. The Spirit will touch you. The Spirit will teach you. Teach you. Or touch you. Or E, come. Sit. Let's look at it together. How can I help someone understand when I don't even understand? Well, you understand that Jesus is the Son of God, right? You understand that Jesus came to live among us, right? He died as one of us, right? He was resurrected, right? You understand that He sent the Spirit as our comforter. You understand that He's alive and with us today. You understand that wherever two or three gather, there He is, right? So you may not be a theologian. You may not be a biblical scholar, but you know the good news of Jesus Christ. And nothing helps a person more than taking the time to sit 
and to listen and to share. And you may not answer all the questions that that person has. You may not even be able to answer a single question that person has. But you can nurture the seed that's in that individual. After, my, after I was baptized when I was 18, I had a million questions. A million questions. And I went to the pastor there, and I, and I told the story. I grew up in Pentecostal church, and I was scared to death and quit going. And then I found this pastor who preached a message of love and acceptance and very welcoming. And I went to him with my questions. And even though he couldn't answer them, he sat there and he talked to me. And I still remember that today. I don't remember the answers. I know one question. I remember asking about the dinosaurs. Where are the dinosaurs in the Bible? <laughs> and he couldn't answer those questions, but he took time. And that's what I remember. And still to this day, he is an influence <coughs> in my life. He is influencing how I preach and what I do. It's very easy to say, here, call my pastor. Go talk to this person. Go do this. It's kind of like calling someone when I, when I had issues with the cable company a month ago. And I called, well, that's the business department. Let me transfer you. Well, that's this department. Let me transfer you. Well, that's this department. Let me transfer It's aggravating. And we don't want to be stumbling blocks for those who have a seed that need to be nurtured. I Googled three words this past week. I Googled Christianity. So if you tell somebody, go Google it. I Googled Christianity, got 118 million results. I Googled Bible, and I got 407 million results. I Googled Jesus, and I got over half a billion results. There is so much stuff. Good stuff, bad stuff, false stuff, rotten stuff. The human mind is overloaded. If we want people to know who Jesus is, then we have to be the ones to take the time and to share it. It's been said that the Christian faith is only one generation away from extinction. And that's because with each new generation comes the renewed responsibility to make Jesus known. Making disciples of all nations begins with a single step. It begins with a simple word. It begins by simply reaching out to a person who has a question. Reaching out and making Jesus known. Do that this week. If every single one of us, I don't know how many people are here, 80, 90, if every single one of us reached out to someone this week, to make Jesus known. Who knows how you'll impact that person's life? And who knows, maybe next Sunday they'll be sitting right here next to you. Who knows? So I invite you to meditate and to reflect upon those words this morning, on the words of Scripture and message and song, and prayer 